three passages from God's Word. They're all related and they'll all be reflected upon in the message that I have to share with you this morning. First of all, from the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 17, and we're going to read the first seven verses. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And then from the Gospel, John chapter 4, we pick it up in verse 5. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. And finally, from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, and we're going to read the first eight verses. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith 
into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. <coughs> God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. I am not gifted to learn foreign languages. My wife is much better than I at that. If we go to a place where English is not spoken, she soon picks up some words and can communicate, at least at a rudimentary level. But I do struggle. In fact, some people would say that I even struggle with English. <laughs> but today I want to give you a lesson in another language. I would like to teach you some words in the Hebrew language in which the Bible, the Old Testament part of it at least, was originally written. All right? Are you ready to learn some Hebrew this morning? First of all, I want you to learn the Hebrew word for with. W-I-T-H. The Hebrew word for with is im. Im. Try that. Im. Im means with. Okay? You're doing good so far. Yeah. We're eating. <laughs> the next Hebrew word that we're going to learn is the word for us. Okay? The word for us is anu. Anu. Try that. And you. Okay? And you. Very good. And the third word, this is a very important word. The Hebrew word for God is El. El. Try that. El. All right. Now, the word for with is Im. The word for us is And you. And the word for God is El. So, Let's try those three Hebrew words together, okay? Im, Anu, El. Now a little faster. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel, God with us, or the with us God, is made of those three Hebrew words. It's actually a sentence, as well as a name. God with us. And we do have a God who is with us. A God who is with us in trouble. A God who is with us in sorrow. A God who is with us in rejection, as well as in times of joy and celebration. And He is a God who is with us forever. Isn't that cool? How three Hebrew words put together produce the name that was given to Jesus, our Messiah. Emmanuel. Now, in today's Old Testament Bible story, we find the whole Israelite community in the appropriately named Desert of Sin, according to Exodus 17 and 1. They were in trouble, and they began to doubt whether God was really with them. There was no water to drink. Now, well, that's a serious problem. It is a serious problem. Like, when there's no water, that's way, way more serious than when there's no toilet paper. <laughs> you can live without toilet paper, but you can't live long without water. 
And these people did what people often do when there are shortages. They quarreled, they grumbled, and they panicked. And they turned on their leader, Moses. Where was God? He was with them, though they did not recognize him. Moses did the right thing. He turned to God with his trouble. He prayed. And God said, I will stand there before you. He was told to take his staff, the same staff that he had used to part the waters of the Red Sea by the power of God. And now he's told to take that, that staff and strike the rock. Now it's interesting. He's told to strike the rock. And where did God say he was going to be? I will be there before you. So it's as if he is striking at God. And symbolically, he was. What happened? There was a miracle of God's provision and grace. Water flowed out of the rock. And the people had plenty of water to drink. It's an amazing story. And I couldn't help but think that there are some parallels in that story to our world situation today. First of all, we do find God's people, God's community, living in a, if you want to use the term, a desert of sin. A world of sin. You look around at the world today, there's lots of things going wrong, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a broken world. The evidence of sin is everywhere. Right now, people are consumed with a problem, the coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it. And there's a lot of widespread anxiety and even panic. Shortages create panic. And panic creates shortages. It's a vicious circle. And there's quarreling and grumbling and criticism of our leaders. These things come along with it. I want you to notice that in the Old Testament story, the rock represented Christ. In case you think that I'm just making that up, the New Testament confirms it. In 1 Corinthians we find these words. They, that is the people in the community, they all ate the same spiritual food. Remember they were given manna from heaven and drank the same spiritual drink, the life-giving water from the rock, and the Bible says that rock was Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground yeah. is sinking sand, says the old hymn. Yeah. Now, I want to turn to the Gospel story. We're going to go to John chapter 4. In this story, we find Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman at the well. Some of you are familiar with this story. Jesus is traveling with his disciples. Normally, the Jewish people would bypass Samaria. They would go around in order to get to Jerusalem. But Jesus went through Samaria. And he went with a purpose. While his disciples have gone to town to buy food, he's sitting by the well, the famous well, the well that was originally made, drilled by their ancestor, Jacob. Jacob's well. And while Jesus is there, in the middle of the day, when people normally didn't come to draw their water, this woman comes. She came because she was trying to avoid the crowds. Yeah, some of you are doing that these days, too, trying to avoid the crowds. But they had a different... Uh, reason at that point. She was coming there because she was something of a social outcast because of her troubled marital history. Well, Jesus asked her for a drink. He asked for a drink of water. Right? In John chapter 4 verse 10 when she questions the fact that Jesus would ask her, a Samaritan woman, for a drink. Jesus answered her, 
if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Fascinating. Jesus says, ask me. I am able to give you living water. And then a little later on, Jesus says, everyone who drinks regular water, well water, will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I would say to you today that until you receive this living water, the water from the rock, Jesus, your life is like a desert desert of sin. The fact is that people all around us are thirsty. Desperately thirsty. Spiritually thirsty. But they don't know what they are thirsty for. And so people try to quench that thirst with all kinds of things. Some people try to fill it with money or quench it with hard work. Some people seek celebrity. Some people get involved in wrong sexual behaviors. Many turn to drugs and alcohol. It's become epidemic in our society. People look for pleasures of all kinds. But the fact is that these things leave them more and more spiritually dry and thirsty. Jesus said he would give living water. What is this living water? It is the love of of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God is love. His love by His Spirit is poured into our hearts. Living water indeed. Hebrews 3.15 says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. You see, a hard heart is not open to receive living water. The living water that God wants to pour into our hearts. Hard hearts are resistant. Hard hearts reject God and push other people away. So the question is, are you going to be hard-hearted or are you going to be tender-hearted? Too many people have a thin skin and a hard heart. Instead, ask God to give you a thick skin and a tender heart. Life goes much better that way. Don't let the living water within you become stagnant. Now, perhaps that shocks you a little bit. You say, can the living water of God in me become stagnant? Is it even possible that living water could become stagnant? Sadly, yes. Allow me to illustrate. In the land of Israel, there are two seas. In the north, you have the Sea of Galilee. And in the south, you have the Dead Sea. When I was in Israel, I had the opportunity to visit both of those seas. The Sea of Galilee up north receives its water from the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows almost straight south. It comes from the north of Israel and it runs down into the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee receives fresh water from the Jordan River. And the Sea of Galilee is fresh, it's clean, it's great to go swimming in, it's teeming with fish, it's a beautiful place. In fact, I can understand why Jesus and his disciples love to spend so much time around the Sea of Galilee. It's just a very attractive place, full of life. From the south end of the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River continues on. And it flows down into the south part of Israel, and there it flows into the Dead Sea, or the Sea of Death. 
The Dead Sea receives its water from the same Jordan River as the Sea of Galilee. But the Dead Sea is stagnant. It, frankly, stinks. There are no fish that can live in the Dead Sea. It's far saltier than the ocean, so much so that there's no life in the Dead Sea. The birds don't even like to fly over it. Now isn't that interesting? The Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea both receive the same fresh water from the Jordan River. So what's the difference? Same water. How can it produce life in one and death in the other? The Sea of Galilee is always giving what it has received. It has an inlet and it has an outlet. The water flows through and the water is kept fresh. The Dead Sea has an inlet but it has no outlet. At 1,300 feet below sea level it is the lowest place on earth. The water that flows into it stops. The Dead Sea receives, but it never gives. And therefore it is stagnant and it is barren. If you are a Christian, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, 